Okay, hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for participating in uh, today's Asian Impact webinar. Uh, today's topic is uh, Project Tridec uh, So uh, this is our uh, proof of concept experiment uh, to connect the uh, financial market infrastructure uh, in ASEAN plus three region uh, with a DLT uh, blockchain. Uh, so um, hopefully we can explain the result also uh, how new technology uh, can accommodate or uh, uh, can be utilized to link the markets, uh, market infrastructures. Uh, so before uh, moving to the opening remarks, I just want to uh, mention a few housekeeping matter. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, please insert in the Q&A box. Uh, we hope that uh, we can have time to respond. Uh, we will have a panel session. Uh, so hopefully uh, after a few questions, I can take questions uh, from the audience. So uh, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, move on to the uh, opening remarks. So I'd like to invite uh, Stephanie Hume, uh, uh, our uh, Director General of the Information Technology Department. So uh, Stephanie, uh, floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. And this is actually part of uh, our Digital Sandbox projects. The team had worked on this uh, initiative to make cross-border security transactions in Asia and the Pacific more efficient and secure through the use of uh, blockchain technologies. This was a collaboration with the ADB team, the Economic Research and the Regional Cooperation Department colleagues, the organizer of uh, this webinar. The central security deposits, a real-time gross settlement we short name CSD, RTGS, very mouthful, <laughs> linkage, aims to establish a groundbreaking distributed ledger technologies consortium that ensure equal governance among the stakeholders. This prototype is first of a kind on two fronts. First, there is actually no low-cost bond settlement system that caters to low volume bonds trading for the ASEAN region. Second, the potential to build a real-time Forex payment network to facilitate this DDP would be very capital efficient and have spillover effects on peripheral use cases such as cross-border remittance and interbank settlement. The downstream benefit to achieve removing the financial inclusion barrier as opposed to lowering the financial inclusion barrier. The significance are one, programmable money, potential CBDC integration, in addition to further improving the seamlessness of cross-border wholesale payment, may also serve as a testbed for programmable money logic, which opens the door for open finance, where the barriers to composable financial services are lower, even further than what our current open banking or open API systems offer. Second, it is always on 24 times 7, real-time cross-border settlement. The cross-border FX component in later stages could allow the piloting of automated market making via decentralized 24 times 7 autonomous exchanges that serve both buyers and sellers using instant on-demand liquidity. Altogether, this innovation offered the ability to encourage easy to access 24 times 7 real-time cross-border commerce. A prototype of a, such a system was successfully tested and presented to ASEAN plus three central banks. The pilot consists of four vendors and that intended to simulate cross-border bond settlement flow across different regions with different blockchain platforms and separate networks. Project stakeholders agree on the importance of demonstrating this solution on a different blockchain platform 
and separate network to simulate the very likely scenario that the central bank and CADs per sending receiving country would not choose the same blockchain technology, nor always use tokenized securities or currency on the same network. So each of the vendor successfully executed success and failure scenario around first, a set of transaction, two, a failure due to an insufficient fund, three, failure due to incomplete invalid data between sending and the receiving side. With that, we were able to complete all the scenario that we wanted to test it. And we would like to thank our partners, R3, which is served as a platform for country A, for the sake of the example that was uh, simulated to be running on the R3's Corda blockchain network. Second, our partner is Consensus serve as the platform for country B. Again, you know, <laughs> for the sake of uh, you know the example that was simulated to be running on Consensus Quorums network. The third partner, Soramisu, serve as the platform for country C that was simulated to be running on Hyperledger's Aurora. And then the last one is Fujisu serve as an interoperability layer between all three vendors using the connection chain system. Ultimately, this successful pilot proved that a future where multiple central banks and CADs having their own enterprise networks and technology platform can still participate in a common consortium where the benefit of low cost low volume yet efficient cross-border bond settlement and real-time forex can be achieved. The next phase would fully explore the downstream benefit beyond the shorter term achievement of the low cost bond settlement system and a real-time forex network for DVP. Thank you very much. You know, I hope you will enjoy the webinar and learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So uh, let me move on to my presentation. I would like to uh, briefly explain this uh, project, Project Try the Gogong, and uh, try to give a sense that uh, what is sort of uh, new or different, and uh, what are the lessons uh, we should learn from this uh, proof of concept experiment. So uh, I just uh, briefly explain the, uh, the objective of this POC and of course participants and assumptions of this uh, proof of concept expectations uh, while well, also explain that the conceptual model and uh, also lastly uh, i'd like to share our key learnings uh, from the poc uh, this may be a most important part okay uh, first uh, poc objectives to demonstrate the, uh, the uh, DLT blockchain solution, uh, well, uh, we really uh, try to find a workable solution for uh, CSD RTGS linkages. CSD RTGS linkages is a proposal by the ASEAN plus three. ASEAN plus three means ASEAN 10 countries plus China, Korea, Japan called ASEAN plus three. Uh, this is a regional group uh, which try to support various uh, financial integration in this region. And one of the initiatives by ASEAN Plus 3 is to connect central bank system and CSD systems in this region to make more efficient cross-border transactions. Uh, thanks to the Bank of Japan and Hong Kong Monetary Authority, they've already established the linkage, but for other central banks and CSDs, cost associated with the linkage is really an issue. Also, uh, we want to explore a more efficient technology. So uh, that's why uh, we thought that the uh, DLT blockchain can be a good solution in terms of expandability, flexibility, cost efficiency, and also the governance uh, that must respect each country's sovereignty. When it comes to the uh, regional sort of uh, linkage, it is always important question, who manage 
those sort of uh, system. Uh, of course, we need to do it collectively, but then uh, uh, we also do not want to create the situation that one country dominates the others. So uh, we think this kind of a distributed solution can be a good fit to this kind of uh, uh, regional uh, initiative. And hopefully uh, we thought that the, uh, this can make a very much realistic solution. So we made a very much realistic assumption and constraints to conduct the study. So uh, we try to connect the uh, different tokens, which already done before, uh, but uh, uh, comparing to the previous uh, proof of concept or experiment, actually in our POC, we connected three different type of blockchain without relying on the single vendor. Uh, this is very important assumption because in the future, we expect each jurisdiction may have their own preferred blockchain solution. An important point is how we can connect those different blockchains. So we try to demonstrate that different blockchain can be connected. Of course, uh, it is often said that that is possible, but uh, we are not 100% sure. And also, uh, in this case, uh, we try to connect three different uh, type of uh, blockchains because uh, when it comes to the uh, cross-border uh, transactions, particularly uh, securities and cash, we need to have two different cash tokens and securities. So we need to mobilize these three different tokens. And uh, uh, we try to sort of uh, simultaneously execute cross-border DVP by dividing into cross-border PVP and the domestic DVP. We actually make this sort of a cross, so-called cross-border delivery versus payment into the two transactions. So actually it's more complicated because uh, cross-border DVP, if it makes a single transaction, it is uh, based on the assumption that the uh, central banks, which issue tokens, and CSD, uh, which issue uh, securities token, can exchange. But uh, uh, in our existing regulations, CSDs cannot have a banking function. And also, uh, we think that the, by dividing into two transactions, we also can demonstrate uh, the two cases, exchanging a cash token, and also exchanging securities and uh, uh, cash uh, simultaneously. So intentionally, uh, we divided into two transactions and we tested more complicated transaction in the real time. And we emphasize the importance of coexistence between, uh, we call it legacy system. So this is the existing banking network and DLT blockchain solution. So uh, that is a very important point that I want to emphasize. So we try to make it as realistic as possible. And we don't expect that the uh, DLT blockchain will replace with a, uh, replacing the existing system. Rather, uh, we expect, uh, we try to model coexistence of blockchain and uh, uh, legacy system. And uh, uh, we invited uh, four vendors in our uh, POC. Uh, consensus, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, you may heard consensus. Uh, uh, this is blockchain fintech companies and offers the codify assets products and custom solution. And uh, Fujitsu, uh, Fujitsu is a Japanese technology company uh, with a, a fintech practice and uh, Fujitsu offers a solution to connect to different blockchains. Uh, three, uh, also, this is well known for the uh, blockchain technology, and uh, uh, we have a, a, a MOU to partner with our three. And uh, in many uh, blockchain POC, our three is uh, participating in those uh, POC solutions. And Soramitsu, uh, another uh, famous uh, blockchain fintech company. Uh, Soramis is quite well known for uh, supporting Cambodia uh, to implement 
their uh, blockchain-based interbank network and QR code payment system called Bacon. So uh, Solaramits really supported the first uh, blockchain-based interbank payment system. So then uh, I just want to elaborate a little bit more on the assumptions and the conceptual model. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, in our POC, we really strictly set the rule. Uh, we don't change any legal regulatory situation because uh, this really creates the uh, kind of unrealistic assumption. Often the POC uh, may be uh, driven by the technology, so they assume that, the, uh, uh, for example, uh, all participants can exchange tokens and have the, those uh, tokens in their wallet. But this may not be so easy and possible in reality. And uh, uh, we expect that the all existing settlement infrastructure and the process will continue. Uh, so we just really focus on the cross-border real-time transaction to be created based on the DOT blockchain. But the rest for the cross-border transaction, we expect to utilize the existing network. And uh, uh, in this regard, all markets allow foreign investors to open and maintain accounts through the custodians. So again, uh, I'd like to emphasize, we are not replacing, eliminating existing uh, payment settlement system. Rather, uh, we try to maximize the function uh, by utilizing the DOT blockchain. Oh yeah, uh, another important point is uh, in our POC, uh, we uh, didn't, uh, 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 trade uh, tokens, uh, we take the FX rate outside of the system because in reality, uh, FX transaction without blockchain transaction uh, is far, far much larger. So we take FX rate outside of the system, outside of our proof of uh, concept. And uh, uh, Important, another important assumption is the central banks are expected not to hold other currencies uh, because first, uh, in our region, many central banks do not want to see offshoring their currencies. They really want to make sure that the, uh, they have a full control over their currencies and also the bonds denominated in local currencies. And uh, in reality also, uh, foreign reserve uh, currency is limited. So uh, in Asia, uh, Asian currencies, not all Asian currencies are held as foreign reserve, uh, which means the currencies central banks may hold as a foreign currency or foreign reserve is limited. So uh, in our assumption, uh, we expect central banks are not expected to have other currencies. And uh, also the, the sovereignty is important. So the only central bank can mint local currency token and CSD can uh, mint, only CSD can mint the securities token. And uh, uh, another important assumption is the token only exists in DLT blockchain solution. Uh, so we sort of uh, uh, conceptualize the DLT-based solution for cross-border uh, transactions. Uh, we are not expecting uh, to use token for other purposes. Uh, so that's a kind of the basic assumptions. And uh, this is really the conceptualization of our uh, assumption. So uh, we continue to see the existence of um, uh, legacy system, existing banking, and uh, uh, security settlement system, that's a kind of a, uh, a circle outside. And in the middle, uh, you can see the dark circle. Uh, this is really uh, the blockchain part. So, um, and under the uh, current existing correspondent banking network, we don't have this kind of a core uh, network, I mean, core solution. So the all the cross-border transactions go through the chain of so-called correspondent banking system, uh, which takes time and often the case that T plus two. Um, but uh, if we utilize this uh, 
in sort of a, a middle solution, the core solution, uh, which can be uh, done through the DLD. Uh, this can be, uh, this enables us to execute the transaction simultaneously in the real time. So uh, that's very important part. And uh, the red box shows the cross-border PVP and the green box shows the uh, domestic DVP. Uh, this is the uh, the flows of the transaction. Let me skip. And uh, also, uh, we have four vendors. Uh, so uh, we conceptualize the market. Uh, the first one is the, the modern economy A. Uh, this is a kind of sort of the um, assumption, uh, which we try to take the model for China, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand. So we have a separate central bank and CSD. Uh, so the uh, CSD execute government bond transaction and central bank settle the uh, cash part. So the two different entities have the two sort of different ledgers. Uh, the economy B, uh, uh, this is uh, based on the model for the Hong Kong, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore. So central banks, uh, the ones who uh, settle the cash as well as government bond. So the uh, single entity keeps the two ledgers, uh, securities ledgers and cash ledgers. Uh, so the uh, single ledger keeps the cash token and uh, securities token. Uh, this model was simulated by Soramitsu. And uh, we also uh, wanted to uh, have hypothetical, but a, a very important uh, model, uh, which is uh, modeled by the consensus. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, we understand uh, the uh, this banking network. Uh, we uh, need to rely on the consortium or private or consortium chain, not the public chain. But um, uh, desirably, uh, we can utilize uh, Ethereum, uh, this kind of uh, uh, publicly available technology. Uh, so uh, we asked the consensus to model a country, hypothetical, but important, hypothetical country. Uh, the country already have the cash and securities token, and uh, that can be in one ledger. So the country C is kind of a hypothetical model, but tokens are widely used. So these are really our assumptions. Uh, let me skip these. So uh, we really try to connect and we try to connect the three uh, different blockchains simultaneously, dividing to the um, domestic DB, uh, sorry, the cross-currency PBP, uh, payment versus payment, and domestic DVP. So let me move on to the key lessons. So we think DLT blockchain has a large potential so uh, DLT uh, blockchain solution may be more resilient and tamper resistant for connecting key market infrastructures. Uh, DLT blockchain solution uh, is quite sort of a solid and may be easier to deploy additional functionality at the later stage than the legacy system. Uh, well, and also uh, uh, DLT blockchain solution often uh, sub uh, and and uh, are provided through the trusted cloud solution, and this may ensure the network security comparing to uh, bilateral connection of the key market infrastructure, and often the case that may be more cost efficient. And uh, uh, another important finding is uh, uh, we actually based on the assumption that we don't change any regulations. But actually, this strict assumption is really hindering the functionality of the blockchain. So if we want to merely maximize the functionality of the blockchain, it is better to consider changing some of the restrictions in the regulations. Another important uh, finding is, actually, we felt that the DLT blockchain is no easier than conventional IT. I mean, we need to have a solo planning uh, and also uh, import sort of a, uh, close communication with IT vendors. Actually, uh, at the beginning, we had a difficulty communicating because uh, we also had the language issue, which means that the, the language used in the blockchain community and the legacy 
IT uh, community is not always the same. So we need to uh, make sure that we understand that we, we are saying the same thing. But once the LT bridge can be uh, deployed, it's quite powerful. And uh, uh, another uh, important issue, uh, so the connectivity between the blockchain, different blockchains is possible. And, but uh, we also need to have a kind of a thorough communication among uh, blockchain service providers. Uh, and there are maybe uh, some blockchain specific issues uh, we need to discuss, uh, which is the timeout and the failure to transact, or maybe the atomic swap and concept of finality. This is really the legal issue, uh, but this needs to be uh, sorted out. And most important point from our lesson is the governance of consortium. The participants of DLT system is really the key. Actually, the cost security very much depends on the decision of consortium members. And uh, uh, finally, I just want to highlight some security features. Uh, and the DLT blockchain solution uh, uh, provides the high level of fault tolerance and the scalability. I think this is a very important point. Uh, well, to hack that system, uh, it's not easy because it's very much distributed. So the, uh, the hacking law is almost impossible. Uh, well, of course, uh, uh, we, not, we may not be able to eliminate the possibility, but uh, again, because of the blockchain and the distributed ledger system, it's very difficult to hack all nodes. So which means there are uh, ways to uh, protect the system. Uh, also, um, this security very much depends on the choice of the consensus algorithm. Uh, so this uh, needs to be decided by the consortium. There's always the custom uh, merit. So uh, that's very much decide a decision of the consortium. And also the data privacy. Uh, and the data is shared among different nodes, different block, uh, di different uh, ledgers. Uh, so to what extent we share the uh, data or in what form uh, that needs to be decided by the consortium. And uh, uh, lastly, I just want to emphasize the importance of um, uh, selection of uh, trusted third party cloud service for successful uh, blockchain, DLT blockchain in implementation, particularly for close border. So uh, that's all for my presentation. and. Uh, then I'd like to invite uh, vendors for our uh, panel discussion. Uh, so uh, from consensus, uh, Monica Singer, uh, she will represent the uh, consensus. And uh, uh, from Fujitsu, uh, Ms. Uh, Fujimoto-san, uh, Mr. Shingo Fujimoto. And from R3, Nitish uh, Solanki. And from Soramitsu, Alexander, uh, Peter Zian. So uh, we have four panelists and hopefully uh, we can share our experience uh, through the panel uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, I'd like to first ask all the panelists, uh, you know, uh, you very much involved in uh, our discussion and what was the biggest challenge uh, you faced during the POC. I appreciate you can share. Maybe uh, starting from Monica. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, it was an absolute fascinating project. After having run the CST in South Africa for 20 years, when I was asked to participate, I thought, wow, this is amazing. And then I've been with Consensus for nearly six years, and I've seen the art of what's possible. So the biggest challenge was really to bring everybody together uh, at the same level. So you could start, yeah, thinking the art of the possible, meaning the technology can do it. And now after nearly two years, we realize that the technology is possible. But we had so many constraints in terms of we had to ensure that we, we did not touch legacy, that we did not touch the law. Everything that uh, Sakura san has explained today it was a huge challenge because it wasn't that we had the free will to do whatever we wanted. We had lots of constraints. So the technology, it's absolutely you know, um, proven. And, and I love uh, listening to Stephanie saying, 
we can do this and we can do that. Trust me, when we started, we did not think that we could do all of these things. So after two years, it's a miracle. And, you know, having worked in legacy uh, financial market infrastructures for so long, um, I know that the, the objectives that we set ourselves for this project had never been done ever in, um, in, in traditional financial market infrastructure. So for me to see that this is possible, it's like a dream come true. And, and, and I hope that everybody realizes the extent of what we have achieved. Then the other issue was that we had three different vendors, not only that we different, but we all use different platforms, different standards, different languages. And then to that, that very clever idea uh, to use um, Fujitsu to, to act as a hub and be able to reconcile all of the technologies. Once again, it proved that we can have different platforms. We don't all have to use the same platform because they can be used at the same time. And that also, I think it's worth incredible. And then, um, you know, clearly uh, the education, the language, you know, Satoru San, you've stated very well, legacy uses one language, this new world order uses a complete different language. So it took, let's be honest, a long time for all of us to be talking the same language. So, um, so I think the project took longer because first, Listen, we, we were talking about all the CSDs, all the central banks. It's never been done. It's like huge what we achieved. And therefore, it, was, it wasn't easy. And, and we mustn't underestimate the, the, time, the many, many hours that we all had to spend in coming together in understanding what, what was the ultimate objective. But I'm really very happy that we achieved uh, what we set out to achieve. So thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, highlighting the importance of communication. And actually, we spent six months <laughs> to come up with the uh, conceptual model uh, just to make sure. Uh, so in that sense, it's quite unique because no, normal IT development, the uh, sort of a, uh, uh, project owner normally has some sort of a, a concept and share and also uh, place the order. But uh, from the beginning, this POC was really kind of, uh, you know, we all sort of uh, share the information, discuss, and we come to the stage that uh, now we think that this is possible. So in a sense, yeah, I also agree, uh, this project was quite unique. Okay, uh, let me uh, move on to the next panelist, uh, Fujimoto-san. So uh, could you share uh, your experience and what was the biggest challenge? Thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, the, I'm Shingo Fujimoto from Fujitsu. Uh, the, um, the, well, the biggest challenge for us is uh, the, the previous uh, presenter, uh, the Monica, said that we had a different languages. However, to the, I could count for the more languages because of the, well, uh, the, not only the four vendors, uh, the, we need to be convinced to the financial uh, the people uh, who is more responsible in their businesses. So the, I think to the, well, for example, like, uh, well, the, we need, we carefully designed to the, our system uh, based on the experience of the financial uh, players, like your chorus bank or a uh, corresponding demands or central banks, they are already doing in their business in real world. Uh, so the, I think to the, to, uh, the, the, because of the, we, uh, the blockchain vendors are very familiar with how the system can uh, optimize to work with the blockchain. However, to the that is not the work for the uh, to apply the real life because of the they already had a certain businesses and responsibilities. So the we first to run about to the how the financial processes are done um, based on the their uh, the regulations and local money like uh, uh, the year markings, for example. Uh, the, that kind of the concept is sometimes very difficult to, to implement in the manner of the blockchain. 
However, to the collaboration work with uh, other all four vendors having a very uh, good discussion, uh, the, sometimes it was nearly to the argue. However, to the, we could finally uh, reach to the good result or the good design uh, to work uh, everywhere else other than the Asian countries. So the, I think that that is a challenge, but uh, that is also the good result of the work, uh, the, the park with uh, ADB. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Fujimoto-san. Uh, actually, in our report, which uh, published uh, this morning, uh, we also show the uh, transaction flows. Uh, so for technical persons, if you want to sort of follow how we enable the transactions, uh, you may be able to check our report and which shows the uh, transaction flows. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is also important because uh, often the case uh, we can say we can connect, but uh, it doesn't give us a much technical details. So hopefully that this report give you the sense that how uh, practically uh, the different chains can be uh, connected. So uh, next, I'd like to ask Nitish uh, for your comment. Uh, what's the biggest challenge? Hello, everyone. Thank you, thomas -san. Thank you very much. I think uh, the, the, the POC had a really great experience for us, and we've achieved really great things uh, as outcome of the POC. We were able to do the cross-border uh, DVB transactions uh, in, a real, in, in a realistic assumptions, right? Uh, I think just to reiterate on the point that you just mentioned uh, in the presentation, right? The cross-border DVP was split into really two parts. Uh, that was a cross-border PVP and then do a domestic DVP. So I think this was a really interesting uh, problem statement and it was quite novel, you know? So we have seen, you know, exchanges involving two tokens earlier in the previous POC, but not, not very much where the transactions involved exchange of three tokens, like the foreign currency, the local currency, and the securities token. So I think uh, the greater challenge was actually ensuring uh, the implementation of this uh, type of cross-border DVP complies with the regulatory requirements. And, and I know we operated in a quite realistic assumptions. Uh, the CFDs had their own assumptions, the, the central banks, RTG system had their own assumptions and own constraints. I think the greater prop challenge was making sure the transactions that gets executed you know, compliance with all of the legal and the regulatory requirements. And I think due to these requirements, uh, uh, the actual implementation led to additional complexity in the operational uh, and the overall transaction business workflow management. But having said that, I think uh, we really achieved great things you know, with, through the collaboration. Uh, we had Fujitsu solution to interconnect all the blockchain solution and then uh, you know, we were also able to come up with the final set of you know, common data set that we have to make sure that which data decides on which particular market and on which region. So I think uh, it was a really great experience uh, for us, all of us, yeah. Thank you, Nitish. Yes, uh, actually, uh, we intentionally divided cross-border DBP into the two transactions, but uh, uh, in realistic uh, transaction manner, uh, this is quite important because when we do the uh, security transaction, we need to change to the local currency. And so, so uh, simulating uh, the real transaction in the blockchain manner, uh, I thought that the, uh, this was quite important. And uh, we really uh, successfully could demonstrate that this transaction can be uh, possible and also uh, important additional novelty of this project is we really show the uh, simultaneous transaction of three different tokens. Uh, this is also uh, technologically uh, quite demonstrative because often the case that we see only two tokens exchange, but we can connect different tokens. Three is just a kind of bar, uh, uh, number. It can be four or five, uh, but uh, of course, if we planned well, designed well, uh, we can connect the different tokens and make it more realistic, real-time transaction. I think uh, that's very important part. Uh, thank you, Nitish. So let me move on to the Alexander. So uh, please uh, share your biggest challenge during the POC. Well, if we only had to pick one, I'd say interoperability. It is perhaps the biggest challenge in all of computer science and in blockchain specifically. And we, we knew that going in. 
so we came prepared um but that preparation didn't help us as much as we thought we did not know many of the assumptions of the regulatory impositions and we didn't know the protocol be slightly different from what we anticipated um, as a result a lot of our fancy developments and a lot of the shiny new tech that we were trying to implement unfortunately had to be scrapped what made this even more challenging was that because we were um, sort of kind of trying to do what we already knew how to do but at the same time there were crucial differences um, we found some subtle mistakes and at some point very late in the demonstration stage we found that our solution was just not reliable enough in fact we assumed that there would be two tokens exchanged the third token um, added another variable which destabilized our protocol well what happened was we went back to the drawing board we came up with a better design and once that was done the entire thing was implemented in under 48 hours and smooth sailing afterwards Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alex Sander and Adam Chan was stunned. You really did all the efforts, and uh, uh, that was a very much difficult part, but successfully uh, we could manage. Uh, we received a few questions. Uh, so, to save time for the questions from the floor, uh, let me uh, move on to the next question, and then I'd like to open the uh, floor. To, uh, to the uh, participants. So uh, based on this POC, uh, uh, what do you want to see happen in the region or in the future? You know, so we had we learned a lot of lessons and uh, uh, that can that those lessons can be utilized for the next project. Uh, but based on the POC, what do you want to see happen? Uh, that would be my question. So uh, can I uh, reverse the order? So maybe starting from Alexander. Okay. Thank you very much, Fujimoto-san. Um, so we want multilateral adoption of blockchain infrastructure. Um, ASEAN plus three is actually the best poised to be the pioneer in this regard. Um, other economies are too, many, too much locked into, into the SWIFT ecosystem to be capable of doing this. And we would also like to see some more free and open source inter blockchain communication protocols like um, the like the work done by our colleagues on Fujitsu. And we'd like to be involved in that work as well. Thank you. Okay, so yes, uh, we'd like to really uh, see further sort of the connection of the different blockchains. And uh, uh, I think that this also opened up the future possibility how uh, blockchain can be utilized for the various transactions, not only limited to the uh, financial transactions. Okay, uh, so let me invite Nitish for your comment on the, uh, you know, what do you want to see happen in the future utilizing the uh, blockchain and also our experience and lessons? Thank you, thomas -san. Yes, uh, I think in the future, uh, so given that um, there has been enormous interest in you know, the central bank digital currencies or the CBDC, CBDC space across the globe, uh, it would be really interesting to see uh, how the current POCs, you know, post-trade settlement can be integrated with a CBDC-based system. Uh, I think that would be really interesting uh, to see in the down the line. And this would really lead to a future scenario where there would be uh, CBDCs, digital assets, and other forms of you know digital currencies uh, being operated, and how that can integrate really well with uh, the settlement of the securities transactions. For example, we can have more use cases coming up. Like we have PVP today, then we could have a PVP or a DVD, the you know, delivery, uh, at sort of new innovations and new mechanisms of doing transactions. I think uh, one of the learnings from this POC is uh, the, the assumption that the tokens were used as a value proxies form. So the issuance of the tokens did not really matter. But I think going forward, if we have to you know, take the POCs and extend it towards uh, different concepts of digital currencies or CBDCs, I think the issuance part would become more important 
and we'll have to pay more attention and get more uh, regulatory requirements, understand how the issuance will affect uh, the uh, central bank digital currency implementation and also the integration with settlement of the securities tokens. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Nitish. Actually, uh, intentionally, uh, we sort of uh, avoid commenting on the CBDC in our report. Um, but of course, the, the functionality and the requirement, uh, what we set in the POC, uh, can be used or considered in actual CBDC connectivity, uh, particularly for the cross-border. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this POC, a proof of concept experiment, can give some sort of, uh, uh, how to say, the uh, thoughts, uh, sort of uh, understanding or uh, highlighting some of the challenges when we really consider the CBDC in the future. Yes, I agree. Okay, uh, let me invite uh, Fujimoto-san. Uh, so what do you want to see uh, happen in the future after this? Uh, we have so many dreams for the, uh, the for the future. However, to the, as a first step, we'd like to solve the real problem for the social uh, real life. Uh, because of the well, after the uh, experience of the uh, the this ADB part, uh, the we could uh, the the uh, proof to the. Uh, the, the blockchain technology can work with the uh, current existing financial systems. But the financial system or settlement is a uh, very, um, the part of the, uh, the, the, the economics in real life. Uh, the, so the, I think to the, well, the, uh, the, the good point of the blockchain will be uh, opaqueness of the processes. But the, uh, the, the, some of the financial settlement is already done for the, such a goal. However, to the well, the, uh, the, the commercial trade and the, uh, the, the trade uh, across to the countries are still the remained as uh, uncovered. So the I think that the, uh, the we would like to uh, use to the blockchain and other technology together to solve the problem of the society. That is uh, uh, the my dream for the uh, next step. That is a part of the, my answer to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fujimoto-san. So uh, Monica, so what's your vision or you know what do you want to see? For me, the most important thing is education. Why? because I can assure you that there are many people that are still absolutely uh, skeptical that this mm -hmm. is going to happen. And therefore they don't even bother learning about it. Mm -hmm. So they don't even start to learn about what is possible, then how are we going to move the market? So that's number one, education, education, education for all the parties in financial market infrastructures. This is no longer a dream. This eventually is going to happen, number one. Number two, I would like to see common standards. I know that there are many bodies that are developing the standards and that will facilitate, of course, interoperability. The third one is not to be so hung up with the current regulations, because as we know, the technology is possible, but we still have quite a lot of legacy regulation that will not make this technology possible. So I believe that slowly but surely, the regulators should start saying, okay, if this is possible, this is our regulation. How do we actually reconcile and amend the regulation to make this technology a possibility? Because as um, you know, um, everybody's saying it, is that if this has proven to resolve real life problems, and therefore we can uh, save time and money and, and you know, this whole thing about 24 seven, 365, which has never been done, amongst all the CSDs and central banks in the region, if that is the, the ultimate holy grail, how do we get there without having all these constraints from the legacy? And yes, I know this is an evolution, not a revolution. So I understand why we are hanging on to legacy and, and allowing all these parties to still have a role, like correspondent banking, global custodians, but eventually this technology will show you that it's faster, cheaper, accessible to all, and, and, and it doesn't require the intermediaries. So I'm just asking that as we learn more and more, we don't hang on to legacy, 
and we allow this technology with all its potential to be implemented in the region. Okay, thanks, Monica. And uh, uh, we are receiving the questions, so, so let me uh, answer or invite panelists to answer. Uh, so the first question is, uh, could you please share the experience for cross-border settlement in ASEAN Plus 3 and relevant document? Actually, before this POC uh, proof of concept, uh, under the cross-border settlement infrastructure forum, we've been discussing how we can connect central bank system CSDs. Uh, we agreed to sort of establish common understanding, common sort of a, a basic framework for cyber security, BCP, and also uh, uh, some sort of a common, uh, the basic uh, standard. So I appreciate if you can look at the our Asian bonds uh, online. Uh, this is a dedicated website for ASEAN Plus 3 ABMI, Asia and Border Markets. And under the CSIF, uh, we have documents, uh, the result of the CSIF uh, discussion, or you can just Google CSIF and uh, CSTRTJS linkages. Uh, you can uh, access to those documents. Uh, the next, is it possible to uh, apply the financial model to the non-financial cross-border transactions? Anyone want to answer this question? Or maybe uh, Nitish, uh, based on our three uh, various POC, maybe you are involved in the, some of the POC non-financial transaction? Yes, sure. Uh, I think, uh, so, you know, DLT has a lot of, you know, opportunities and potential across, you know, different verticals, uh, whether it could be financial or even for non-financial sectors. Uh, you know, for example, we have seen in the past how DLT can be used for, you know, recording the of the land registration or the land title, the property registration or property ownership of, uh, you know, of some certain country on the blockchain. Uh, there have been some POCs involved in the past on that line. Uh, so yes, it's possible. Uh, DLT opens up doors uh, for different verticals and different use cases uh, where you can apply a similar model. I can imagine that there would be some use cases coming up where you can digitize and you know tokenize some of the different assets uh, and make them digitally recorded on the ledger and where you can track the ownership of the digital assets and tokens on the ledger. So DLT basically provides potentiality of immutability, you know, there's the privacy, the security guarantees as well. So, you know, the same model of what we use for financial transactions, in this, um, uh, technically you can map them to non-financial uh, transactions uh, and for non-financial use cases as well. There would be some changes required in terms of the design, in terms of what data gets stored on the ledger, what data gets stored off the ledger, and also how do how do the transactions are represented? You know, the financial transactions I would say are uh, sometimes more complex, and we have to pay a lot of attention because there we have to uh, make sure the transactions comply with the regulatory requirements. But sometimes the non-financial transactions might not be that complicated, uh, but of course, uh, in, in any sort of transactions where there is a TVP or you know a recording of some fact or assets on the ledger. Uh, we need to come up with some standardization and regulatory requirement, actually. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Nitish. So uh, let me move on to the uh, next question. Uh, from your perspective, what kind of input will be necessary to push the regulators to move forward blockchain-based overseas transactions more positively? Well, uh, uh, actually, I think Monica already highlighted the importance of education. Education should not be limited to the private sector, I believe. Uh, uh, this is also equally applicable to the uh, regulators. Uh, the crypto asset blockchain does not mean bad thing. <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, we need to make sure that they, what is represented based on the technology. Uh, the technology is just a technology. And uh, yeah, that needs to be uh, uh, changed. I think, uh, Alexander, you want to have a comment? Yes. Uh, thank you, Thomas-san. And again, I need to thank Fujimoto-san for his pioneering contribution in this area. Um, the biggest issue with blockchains in general as a technology is fragmentation. There's so many things that are possible, so many diverse approaches that could be taken, that um, blockchains are practically incapable of speaking the same language without imposing an external protocol on them. And the work that is done by Fujitsu um, namely Hyperledger Cactus, which has recently been rebranded to Cacti, is one of the key 
shall we say, technologies which will enable blockchains to be useful across the globe and in contexts in which they're not traditionally viewed positively. This entire proof of concept would not be possible without their work. And I would um, also point out that education had been uh, a vital part of making this possible, including not just education of um, regulatory bodies, but um, us as engineers and developers. Yeah, thanks, Alexander. And actually, uh, your comment actually answers the next question, what was the number one challenge? And uh, yeah, the sort of uh, communication of the different blockchain, I think uh, this is important. And uh, this POC proved that the, uh, this is possible. And uh, of course, it's not easy. It's not easy, but uh, this is possible. Uh, so uh, let me move on to the uh, next question. So what is uh, crucial uh, reasons to use this blockchain tech in international transaction? What is the main value? So why we use blockchain? Well, uh, let me answer because I started the POC. Uh, well, under the uh, current uh, financial transactions, uh, we use cross-bonded banking network. And we don't have um, the links uh, between uh, uh, sort of uh, individual countries' uh, market infrastructure. So this POC uh, focused on the new transaction flows. We are not replacing it. And uh, we try to show the, uh, the possibility uh, the blockchain can be a good alternative uh, because uh, connecting the two main flames in different countries requires lots and lots of efforts because two different countries, communication, network, synchronization of uh, data, and even uh, sort of uh, sending the message, this requires huge efforts. Um, but uh, through the blockchain, uh, thanks to the technology, uh, well, blockchain uh, can facilitate this sort of uh, simultaneous transaction uh, called the uh, uh, the process called the uh, uh, atomic swap. So, in the cross border transactions, you know, you never know what would happen. Suddenly, you may have a kind of a shortage or cut of the electricity, or some sort of uh, uh, you know natural disaster may prevent you to access the others. But I, I thought that the uh, this POC really proved that the uh, blockchain can be a good solution uh, for critical market infrastructure. So that's one point I really would like to add and answer that question. Of course, the utilization of the blockchain is not limited to this cross-border transaction, but uh, at least for this POC, uh, we try to show the usefulness of the uh, blockchain. Uh, so next, uh, yeah, uh, coming to the last end. So this should be the last question. Apart from uh, uh, regulatory compliance, government willingness, blockchain, uh, and particularly public chain like Bitcoin and Ethereum often struggle with the uh, scalability uh, when it comes to the processing high value transactions quickly. As uh, cross-border payment infra uh, involves the numerous participants and the large uh, transaction volumes, is a scalability transaction through the inherited and un unsolvable challenges that impact the uh, real adoption and the implementation in production? Uh, well, uh, let me answer first, and I'd like to uh, have the comment uh, from the uh, the panelist. Uh, well, actually, uh, when we, I mean, the reason we try to apply the blockchain solution for this cross border, particularly this interregional. A cross border transaction is the um uh, the the frequency of transaction is not high uh i mean comparing to the uh at least the exchange uh, stock exchange transaction uh transaction frequency is not high uh participants can be large uh because we uh may be able to expand the scalability to the large number of the participants but uh, the, uh, in terms of uh, transaction frequency, uh, this is limited. So that's why uh, we thought that the uh, the blockchain solution can be uh, applicable for this kind of cross-border linkage. Uh, okay, so Alexander, do you want to comment on this? Yes, um, this is um, an area which we have focused on greatly. And 
Um, the important thing to remember here is that Bitcoin and Ethereum are very early developments in blockchain space. Um, they were designed with a very different mindset and they were not designed to handle a large volume of transactions. They just accidentally happened to be so popular that they did. And the best way to sum up how this approach can be resolved is to think, how did we resolve this in the case of different countries? Um, you can partition any large network with a high volume of transactions into a smaller one. And in some cases, most transactions are grouped by these networks. In that situation, um, if you have a single ledger that's called sharding, um, and it's popular in parachain approaches, and um, our current work is underway to do this in a context of a traditional monolithic ledger. But also, it's possible to combine several monolithic ledgers, um, assuming that transactions are more frequent between some groups of people, um, into consortia, just like the one that we've presented here. Um, it doesn't have to be countries. It can be um, any groups of people. It could be provinces in China. It can be provinces in Japan. It can be um, people who are frequently trading amongst each other in foreign exchange contexts. And they could have their own blockchain, and that blockchain can operate um, completely independently and on the same computers as uh, blockchains which they connect to. And the connection chain uh, just synchronizes this information across different blockchains. So scalability isn't an inherent problem. In fact, it's a, it's a problem that is so often brought up that there are multiple solutions to that one issue. Just the few that I mentioned are not even scratching the surface. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, uh, unfortunately, it's really time to wrap up. So uh, I'm sure you may have uh, lots of questions, um, but uh, feel free to send us questions and we can correspond with an email. And also, uh, please visit our Asian Bones online website. Uh, you also can find various information related to the market infrastructure, the bond market developments. Also, uh, we will organize ASEAN Plus 3 Bond Market Forum during the week of 24th July uh, in a hybrid manner. Uh, the meeting will be held in Tokyo, but also you can join through online. So uh, if you're interested in a particular session on this uh, uh, DLT solution, also the legal issues, uh, we can discuss on the 27th July. So please join our ABMF meeting as well. So uh, let me uh, uh, conclude by uh, thanking everyone for supporting the uh, Asian Impact webinar series. Uh, this actually started from uh, 2020. Uh, for update on the upcoming webinars, uh, please check the webpage in uh, adb.org. And uh, you can also view the past webinars from the uh, ADB's official YouTube channel. Also, uh, I would like to uh, invite you to uh, see the, um, our chief economist, Aldo Park, on Twitter to gain insights into uh, development challenges facing Asia and the Pacific. So we also share those sort of uh, our researches by our uh, ADD colleagues. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you, Range, for participation. And I hope to see you in the next time. Thank you so much.